public comments, Connie? We do not. We do not, so we're going to move forward with our agenda. And we get to have Bob Templeton from Zonda Education come up and do our fall preliminary demographer report. This will be an interesting one. Bob smiles. <laughs> yes, it will. They're, yeah. they're always interesting. Yes, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. But the, the interesting part is changing. Yes. And it is um, crazy to think that, you know, just literally four to five months ago, the interest rates were three percent, and the housing market was really on fire and performing at nearly record-breaking levels. So I'm going to touch on the impacts of that, how it is affecting housing. It is going to affect housing. Mm -hmm. Housing is interest rate sensitive. There's no way of getting around that. The challenge is for the younger buyers and is for the move-up buyers. The reason that sounds kind of like it shouldn't go together, but the reason that it affects the younger buyers is that they will not have challenges with qualifying and with affording the, the payment. Because when you go from a 3% interest rate to a 7% interest rate on about a $350,000 house, that has raised the monthly payment by around $800. So that's what that means to go from three to seven. And so for the move up buyers, it's because many of them are already in a house so they already have a mortgage at 3%. So therefore, when they're shopping and thinking about the move-up home or the home in a different area, they're going to be hesitant because of that 7% interest rate, which then causes them to be fear of buying at the top. They don't want to buy at the top, and they don't want to have that 7% 7 7 interest rate for a longer period of time. So it's going to really affect those two buyers. It does not primarily affect the relocation buyer. So the buyers that are relocating to the region because of a job change or a family change, so those buyers that are coming because they're moving because of jobs, they tend to have to find a house. And so therefore, if you're renting, the renting is very expensive. So therefore, then we tend to see those buyers continue to buy. This is where, when we think about the economy, it is so uh, conflicting in that we've got good job growth in the state of Texas. So job growth is strong. Wage growth has been good, but then on the other side, we've got 40-year uh, high inflation on the cost of food and energy and services. <coughs> Everything is more expensive, but yet wages have gone up, but they haven't gone up enough to keep up with the cost of living. Now, I want to touch on this year's enrollment pattern because really, we want to keep things in context. Last year was a record-breaking year that was also while we were in that record-breaking housing boom. So that housing surge led to last year's strong enrollment growth of about 700 students last year. This year, these are early September, mid-September numbers, so we're still a little bit shy of that October snapshot, which is what we forecast too. But if we had taken out last year's numbers, this year's numbers would look pretty normal with what we have seen as a growing district. So I want to keep things in context. So what's really happening is things are getting back to where they were in 2019. So in 2019, we were seeing three, 300 ish enrollment growth. The housing was doing about six to 800 homes a year. And we were growing three to 350 students a year. Those were good times and those were good numbers. But because we saw this abnormally high year in 2020, 2021, then that's what's leading for many to think, oh wow, you know, this is a 20 to 30 percent drop. Well, it is a drop if we compare it to last year, but if you compare it to 2019, it's more normal. So what's happening is things are returning to a little bit more normal pace as to prior to the pandemic. The unemployment rates are almost back to where they were prior to the pandemic, but it doesn't feel that way. It doesn't feel like the unemployment rates are back to where they were because every industry is struggling to fill positions. You still see it in restaurants, you see it in professional services, and I had three openings over the summer, and I've never had that amount of turnover. And they were getting new jobs and moving, and so there was all of this relocation that was happening that really created some challenges in the labor force. Now, the labor force is starting to return as well to a little bit more normal. Overall housing numbers. This is total home sales within Dalton ISD. 
you can see what it did in 2020, and you can see even 2021, those were record-breaking years for total home sales. So far, year to date through August, you can see we're definitely going to fall back towards that 2018, 2019 number. So it's not going to be like we saw the last two years. Again, just the interest rates. Now, this is the average price for a new home and an existing home sale within Belton. Again, you can see the real surge that happened over the last two years. That was two factors. It was the demand was so strong that that allowed for sellers to ask more because the demand was so high, but also it was the cost of materials. It was the supply chain challenges. The cost literally accelerated because of labor shortages and material costs. So the material cost for lumber a while back was really high. Lumber's getting back more to normal, but we still have challenges with HVAC systems and roofing materials, and so there are still challenges that are driving up that cost. Now, when we interviewed builders recently, and this was a DR Horton regional manager, the DR Horton regional manager was telling us we're going to sell all the homes that we have under construction, and we're going to close them. The only question is how much we're going to have to cut the price to get them off the books. So the reality is this change in the interest rate has caused an increase in cancellations. So prior to the pandemic, the cancellation percentages would have been at 12 to 13 percent range prior to the pandemic. Now the cancellation rate is back to about 15 to 16, 17 percent. So we have seen an increase in cancel. And why are they canceling? It's because when they signed the contract to buy that house back in late spring, they thought that house was going to be finished in you know September, October. It's not finished, so they can't lock in the interest rate. So now their monthly payment has gone up that five to eight hundred dollars, and they can no longer afford to, for that payment. That's really what drives that cancellation rate. It's not because they wanted to not come to the area. It's just a pure math problem for the interest rate. Bob, a quick question on that on the previous slide. So when I look at average new home price there, in 2022, it says 360. And so to your point, you're saying all those new home builders, their yeah. agents might drop those prices. They're drop they the were price. getting bigger prices at first, but now because of interest rates, it might. Yeah. So yeah. that could go down by the end. It will. It will go down. What's interesting is if you if you have Trulia on your phone or if you have those apps, you're already starting to see the down arrows where they're softening the price of existing homes. So the existing home market, and it depends on what region you're looking, but I still have Trulia and I play shop just <laughs> to see what's happening in regions, and you will start, we're starting to see it dropping. And so the price points are going to soften over the next uh, few months. You know, Bob, I'm in the floor business, and so I'm, I'm already seeing this in our industry. And what's happened was, was for the last two years, the customers that I have, they wouldn't take custom builds. Because number one, you gotta babysit them the whole way through, and it's a divorce proceeding when they close, because right. they're both tired of each other doing it. So they were just building spec houses, because they would have seven or eight offers on the spec house, and they were selling them People were just paying cash yep. to make make up for their appraisals, and now I've seen it's gone back to the old days where they're taking the customs, the, the sheer deals, the things. So we've seen it even with my 15 or so builders that I deal with in this area, they're starting to change their game plan yeah. already too. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's and, and it is going to affect us pretty pretty big, I think, over the next six to 12 months. It it, it is. It is the unfortunate nature of economic highs and lows. The Fed's um, reasoning for raising the rate was to try to slow down inflation. And so that's the attempt. Now, who knows if they're going to be able to pull off a hard or a soft landing or what it's going to do. So the reality is if we still see high inflation rates, then the interest rates are going to stay up and they possibly could even raise them a little more. I don't think so. I think we're at the peak for that. But should inflation soften, then they'll likely ease up on the interest so we could see them bounce back down into that 5% range, hopefully, in, in the next few months. I heard an analyst this morning talk about it, and he had the opinion that he thinks it'll get closer to 8 before it caps out. But then at next year, in the 23rd quarter, is 
is what their people are predicting is when things are going to ease up, or yeah. things are going to come back. Come back. Don't know where it will ever go back to <coughs> where we had it, you know, the 3% or right. lower. But he said right. it will start coming maybe next year in the third quarter. That's right. just what this one analyst was talking about this morning. And here's the map of the district. These are your current elementary attendance zones. Those gray shaded areas are the active subdivisions. The yellow shaded areas are the futures. We've got 53 actively building subdivisions. We've got 16 future subdivisions. Now we still have developers developing the lots and there's about 1,900 lots that are in development to be delivered. So, you know, this is not going to stop growth. It's just going to slow growth. Now we saw this even in the 2007 housing crash. So I was working with Fast Growth School Districts back in 2007. Districts like, you know, Frisco, Northwest, Denton, that were building 2,500 homes a year, it dropped it down to 1,800 homes a year. So we will still see growth even with this uh, challenge with the housing market. Now the other side of the coin is multifamily. So multifamily is also starting to surge. I know it's a little hard to see, but zoomed in there, those purple shaded areas are multifamily that are under construction. So we've got about 235 multifamily units under construction, and there's an additional 660 multifamily units that are in the planning stages. Those are the turquoise shaded areas that are up in the Tarver uh, purdled zones, and then you've also got those under construction that are in the uh, Chisholm and Miller Heights, in the southwest zones. Now those typically are lower yield. They are lower yield. Yeah. So it won't have the same effect as what we see with single family. Single family tends to yield between 0.4 and 0.6, and the multifamily is going to yield in the 0.2 range. Now here's just some highlights of the single family. Now we do have satellite imagery from August the 5th that we're able to access to look at what's happening. Mesa Ridge is about 425 total lots. It's, um, they had about 55 homes under construction when we did the research. The first residents are expected late fall this, this year. So we could have families starting to move into Mesa Ridge for this school year, and that's in the Tarver Elementary Zone. And then next we're gonna look at Westfield. Also, I think that's in the Tarver Elementary Zone as well. It's about 1,000 lots. They have built about 142 homes in the last 12 months. They have groundwork underway on phase uh, 14, which has 117 lots. That current <coughs> yield is about 0.51 students per house in Westfield. Next, we're looking at Skyview Edition. This is down in the Chisholm Trail Attendance Zone. Skyview's got about almost 200 lots. The final plat was approved in July. The groundwork is underway on all of the lots. And then you've got West Canyon Trails, which is next door, which is about 174 lots. 35 homes under construction in West Canyon Trail. And we think they're gonna be building about 40 to 50 homes per year. That's a early yield. I expect that yield is gonna go up as we get more occupied homes, but it's about 0.24 right now. Now the far north section of the district in the High Point Elementary Zone, this is a new development that's just started. It's uh, about 80 acres. These are larger lots. The groundwork has started. So um, could start to see home construction there in the spring to summer is when we'll see homes going up in that area. These are likely gonna be more expensive homes. It's kind of out toward the lake and on the very edge of the district. Hubbard Branch, and you're familiar with Hubbard Branch. Um, it's you know fairly active, about 37 homes under construction. There's groundwork underway on phase two with 170 lots, and they're building about 50 to 60 homes per year. The current yield is 0.419 students per home. Again, this will go up, and it's really gonna go up when we get the new school open, so that will definitely have an impact on the yield when the new school gets opened it within Hubbard Branch. Three Creeks, very familiar with Three Creeks, about 1,500 total lots. 
It's got 135 homes under construction. This is the D.R. Horton project that there again, he mentioned that, um, you know, they're gonna move those homes. It's just a matter of what point do they have, how much do they have to cut the price to get them moved. But the current yield is rather high at 0.65 students per home. That's pretty normal. That's a normal yield that we see is in that, you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.65 range. Now there's a future on the other side of 35, which is River Farms. This one likely could get delayed just because of the timing of what's happening in the housing market, but it represents almost 1,800 homes. The groundwork is anticipated to begin late 2022, so we'll see. You know, these are the kind of projects that they could wait because it doesn't do them any good to bring them on too early when the market may be about to change. So it'll be one we'll just watch very closely to see when they break ground. But when it does get going, it likely would have the same kind of velocity as what we would see at Three Creeks. So it would be one that would easily do more than 100. It's such a large development that those developments really aren't interested in building 10, 20 homes a year. No, they really are about the 100 to 200 homes per year. I the other thing, go ahead. I wonder was that corporation buying that the Hunt Corporation, or mm -hmm. I think is who it is. I wonder if they're gonna sell that to national builders or are they gonna try to schedule it out with more local flavor? That'll have a lot to do with how fast that thing moves also. It will. You know, this. I think that the Belton, Temple, Clean, Waco region is one of the strongest regions for future potential because of the location to DFW, because of the location to Austin. This region is in a very strategic position. We, you know, you've heard about the, the chip plants that are being built in um, Sherman, which is Texas Instrument, and then there's the Samsung plant in Taylor. Well, we're also seeing, just recently, there was a um, clean room fabrication plant that's being built in this region to support those two plants. So they build clean technology with insulation and they're, they're, they're a manufacturing group that builds these hyper clean rooms that can't have any dust. They're super clean for the manufacturing of these chips. So that's coming to this region. And it's, it's you know, a couple hundred jobs. It's about a 40 million investment into a facility. But those are the kind of things that we'll see because of the location to Sherman, location to Austin, this region is in a very strategic spot proximity-wise to the DFW region and Austin, really even for Houston. You know, you're not that far removed from, from getting material and product to Houston. Now, here's the multifamily yield analysis. This is from the Geocode. So we've Geocoded your students for this year. We've got about 710 students currently that reside in about 2,600 multifamily units. The average yield across the district is 0.267, compared to the average yield for a single family is in that 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 range. So it's about half of what single family is. Those green shaded areas are multifamily projects that have a yield of less than 0.25. The yellow are yielding between 0.25 and 0.5. The orange are yielding between 0.5 and 0.75. So that gives you just this sense of where you have the highest yielding multifamily developments across the district. Here's the geocode dot map. So we geocode your students. We've got roughly 560 students that reside outside the district. Now, those numbers are going to vary just a little bit because we've got some kids that are right on the line. And so our number may be a little different from the TEA number just because of the proximity of where they live in relationship to the line. Um, that's about 4% of your student population. About 25% of your population reside within the Belton city limits, and about 39% of your student population reside in the Temple city limits. And that's actually changed quite a bit over the last five years, so the growth being so strong in that harbor uh, area is really causing that temple percentage to get a little higher. Here's the yields over the last several years. We do this geocode every year, and you can see the single family yield is the green line, and so it's been staying right around 0.6. It went up a little bit this year to 0.637, 
the multifamily yield has actually dropped a little bit. It, it was a peak at about 2015 when it was 0.38. Now it's about 0.267. And we have those yields for every subdivision in every planning area of the district. We just sum it up to give you the big picture. So here's the projections. You'll notice that uh, I have softened them considerably from where they were last spring. And so I'm basically holding about a two to almost 3% growth rate. Bottom line is that's assuming that we continue to build between six and 800 homes a year. And we were building closer to 1,000 homes a year. So it's dropped off. I have dropped the housing forecast. But if we maintain that you know, two to 3% growth, in five years, by 2027, the district's enrollment could be at about 15,500. In 10 years, enrollment could be over 17,300. So the reality is, as long as we stay in this period of higher interest rates, I think it is going to hold the growth down to this 2 to 3%. That's still good growth. It's still healthy growth. It actually may be a benefit because it could hopefully push back some of the pressure on some of the campuses. Now, when we look at the campuses, we know you're going to be opening two elementaries. We also know we're expanding the capacity of uh, Southwest. So we are providing some pretty significant uh, capacity at the elementary level, but it is primarily going to impact Chisholm Trail. It's also going to impact Tarver. There'll be some soft impacts on some of those other elementary schools, but we will definitely <coughs> see Chisholm Trail yellow, Harbor Yellow be pushed back many, many years. And we're just starting that attendance on process. So there will be a process that we'll work through. We'll bring it um, for, to your attention, I think, at, at our next board meeting. So later on is when we'll involve you know, additional members to see how we're gonna work through this attendance on process. But definitely gonna impact those uh, areas that are yellow with Chisholm Trail, and with a Tarver Elementary. Now at the secondary level, it's North Belton Middle School that's approaching capacity in 2025, 2026. So this softening in the housing market could buy you a little more time at your secondary campuses. So North Belton's approaching it in three years. Maybe we get lucky and it's four to five years. At Lake Belton <coughs> High School, it's gonna be approaching capacity in 2026, and then you can see by 2028, it could possibly be exceeding capacity. Key takeaways, the enrollment trends are returning to pre-pandemic levels. The interest rates are impacting home sales. We expect 2023, that will be a key season. When we do the research in the spring, we're now really gonna see how the builders are being impacted by these higher interest rates. The spring season is the builder's um, biggest season because most families are trying to time their move to occur over the summer. So therefore, they're most active when, with buying and shopping in the spring. So that's gonna be a, an important period for us to see. The five-year enrollment is headed towards 15,500 students. So it's really not a matter of if that's gonna happen. It's just a matter of does this slow down and then get pushed back, or does it return back to the periods that we saw? I don't know that it's gonna to return to that 3% anytime soon. So I think we really could see this 300 to 350 enrollment growth for the next couple of years, and then maybe in four to five years it jumps back up. 10 year, we could top 17,300 students. The new elementary schools need to support the current enrollment, they will support the current enrollment at Chisholm Trail and Tarver Elementary Schools. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Something that I was thinking about when you were talking about the middle school, when we start looking at the redistricting, I know the two new elementaries and the addition is gonna impact all of our elementaries and how we're gonna move that around. But are we gonna take a look at our middle school to possibly ease that uh, growth at North Belton to maybe buy ourselves another couple of years before, you know, the next. I think you might feel free to jump in on this. I think it's going to come down to some parameters that we have to adopt with our board as well, because I think we definitely can do that. Um, at, at what cost, and I don't mean dollar amount, because I think that this 
discussion that we have to have because if you start doing that, you might take away from the, I, I would say, almost clear feeder patterns that we have uh, if you start to try and balance it out a little bit. So, Mike, what, any thoughts that you have? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, when we last did attendance boundaries, we had to do it for all three because we were open in the high school, we were open in the middle school, and we were open in the elementary school all at once. So. Uh, I do think that um, as we work through some other discussions too, I think we have a, one of the focus groups that we're creating is a, a group of community members and school folks to discuss capacity and utilization. So I think we have some opportunities uh, because of the softening a little bit and it's not gonna, the urgency isn't gonna be there that we might need a middle school in two years, that we can really study how well we utilize our, our buildings and our spaces and how well that we might can have some impact on capacity through that work as well. So, yeah, I mean, I, balancing uh, uh, enrollments and, and, multi, and uh, you know, maximizing capacity are two really important parameters of any type of process. Also knowing, you know, we've had as many as 1,100 students in North Belton Middle School before, and I won't say that that was optimal, but we were able to pull that off without adding portables at the time too. So I, we do think we've got some work we can do internally for strategies of utilization and capacity building that we might can push that back a little further as well. So I think that if you take a look, like the 27, 28 school year is, is a good one for us to look at. You can see the difference between those schools did not have fun at that time. You got. 905, 1,026, 866, and 895. So potentially, depending on where kids live, you could shift one boundary or so and balance it out a little bit, but it's not a huge discrepancy like a, you know, a 1,400 versus a 600 that we're talking about. So I think we're gonna have to, when we will be coming back to you all as a board, talking about parameters for some of our attendance boundary discussion, and I think those types of things we have to have a discussion about clear feeder patterns or, or true feeder patterns is a big deal for a lot of people. So could we potentially move some people from the north to the south? Yeah, but it might impact those true feeder patterns as well. So I think we'll have to discuss all that. And I think one thing we have to factor in to our parameter discussions is gonna be the political climate at the time. I think we found out this last go around that, it, that across the state of Texas was at 62% yeah. of bonds made it this time. Yep versus normally in the mid 80s. Yeah. I mean, some of it has to do with language that they make us put on our ballots nowadays, which is whatever, yeah. almost said something, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering though, because we need to think about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, ma'am, would you rather your kid have to move schools or are we ready for another bond? Yeah. You know, and it depends on how long we need to push that out, depending on a lot of different factors. And I bring that up, I know that's a, t a touchy subject, yeah. but I just bring it up because I think that's something to think about. Absolutely. Because this last one was a pretty tough go. Yeah. And I just think that's something, to, you know, you gotta go to your stakeholders and say, what's more important? Yeah. Where your kid goes, you know, we know we know there's a new middle school coming online at some point, we know that. Yep. But that's just something to think about. Hopefully things, after this go around, this you know next couple of years, hopefully things will start to balance out a little bit with the political climate. Yeah. I, you're right on the money, I think, as we talk about long-term planning, we have to take all of that into account. Yeah. Um, to Bob's point, it's not that the kids aren't gonna come, it's how fast they come right now. Yeah. This still, you know, these growth rates are still a fast growth school district in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. It's just not the accelerated growth that we saw over the last two years that really was tough to deal with. Could it come back? I can tell you there, a lot of developers and industry partners that, to Bob's point, look at this area at the intersection of I-14 and I-35 is prime area to be developed. And so when that stuff comes in, that usually comes from housing burdens as well. Um, whether that's multifamily or single family, that's a, that's a different story. And, uh, a lot of it depends on, I think, interest rates and economic conditions. You know, one thing to consider is that when you look at the middle school total, numbers. When you get out about seven, eight years, when you get 3,700 middle school students and your capacity is, we'll just say 3,900, you've just about used up all of the capacity that there is because you cannot get 100% utilization. Yeah. When I say you can't get 100% utilization, 
I'm talking about the differences in the class sizes. So the seventh grade class is a certain size that's bigger than the eighth grade class or the sixth grade class. So then those anomalies in the class sizes cause those imbalances in the number of sections or the classes needed. So where the reality is when you get to 90% of your maximum capacity, those buildings physically feel like they are full. So yes, there likely is some tweaking that could be done, but it's, I'm, I'm gonna phrase it, it's a band-aid on the issue. And now districts like um, Waco, because they're not growing, they really do need to look at the uh, attendant zones as a tool to balance their enrollments because they're not growing. So therefore, when they make changes to the attendant zones, it has a longer stickiness that will last longer. I see. So, and that doesn't mean we shouldn't look at them, just saying we have to keep it in the context of our growth that, okay, ultimately, you are going to need another middle school. Yeah. There's no, I have no qualifications with that statement because you have so much available land and so much future growth that is going to come that it's just a matter of when are we going to need it and are there some strategies that we need to do to buffer that which that's when we can look at this through the attendance zone. Yeah. Is it Aaron? Yeah. Yeah. Well they are interesting times so you're totally correct. It is interesting in how it is flipped and it, it didn't take that long to flip. You know back in, in March and April, May we were at 3% interest rates and the housing was really on a hot streak. And here we are in the fall, and it's a little different picture. Yeah, so. I was reading an article this morning how quickly it's turning into a buyer's market. Mm -hmm. if, you've got cash, if you've got cash, it really is a buyer's market because now you are going to be able to watch and look for discounts and it's because the, the sellers are going to start softening. Mm -hmm. Mike, anything that you want to add? One question that often comes up in this is the transfers and we Bob mentioned some of the transfers in and transfers out. Anything you want to add on transfers? I, I would out? say so that, you know, when we compare, so there's really kind of three data sources on that. There's the, when, when Zonda pulls their geocoding to kind of put these together, it's not going to reflect any kid after that point that maybe did it, was an approved transfer and didn't show up, those sorts of things. The TEA number is always a little different than just our, our, the applications that we've received that have been approved that goes in. So I will say this, that in the, the hot dot, the geocoding dots, I think they're a little over 500. I think our actual list of approved transfers is a little under 500. So it's right there within 15 or so kids of each other. I think if you if you were to run a true up on that through Skyward, I think you would probably see those numbers a little closer together. So that this is something we've seen probably out in the last four years we've been working together is that geocode number that comes from Skyward is generally a little higher than the actual approval rate that we've had. So, but it's all within the ballpark of what we shoot for, which is 4% of our total enrollment. Um, I will say that the, those transfer numbers held true again this year, that over 60% of those transfers are employees' children as well. So we haven't seen a, a uh, steep increase in just the, you know, the family that lives in another school district and wants to come here, we're seeing about 40% of that of that 500 or so are that family and about 60% or a little more are employees' children that come into the district. Overall, I feel really good about, we got some good projects going on right now. Uh, you know, a softening and growth isn't a bad thing for us. I think it allows us to catch our breath a little bit because building uh, enough schools for 700 kids a year is different than I think in a really good spot right now. I'm excited to see dirt moving on some of our projects that Michael talked a little bit more about coming up. So, thank you, Bob. You're welcome. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. All right, so guess what? We've already touched on it a little bit. We're going to talk a little bit about the attendance zone process. I'm guessing that's probably Mike Morgan. Future Dr. Morgan. Future Dr. Morgan. Yeah. Texas Tech right here. There we go. Guns up there. Um, I love, I'm, I'm really excited to talk about this, and I really want to talk about kind of next steps, because I think you just hit on it. We have done um, a little preliminary work when we had our first meeting of our long-range planning, uh, long-range facilities planning team 
week before last, we did an exercise with them to start talking about uh, tennis boundary parameters and, and kind of went through a little, a little exercise with them to kind of see which, which parameters they felt like our community values most. We're going to have opportunities to have several more stakeholder discussions around parameters before we ever bring out uh, proposed uh, tennis boundaries to see where people feel about it. So uh, the board will definitely have a, 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 an opportunity to heavily weigh in on that subject. And then we'll also get some community input. And we'll also get some of our school leadership and our school, our school input. Um, when you're talking about parameters, uh, you're talking about, and, and we, we examined, we talked through about 13 different ones the other day, is that, you know, that, that idea of what are the things that we need to consider most strongly whenever we're, we're working on new tennis boundaries. And that is, you know, is it community, is it neighborhood alignment, is it feeder patterns, is it balancing uh, demographics, is it balancing uh, enrollment is it, you know, you obviously want to, anytime that you're, you're having to build these facilities, you always want to maximize the use of all your facilities. You don't want to have schools with, uh, you know, that are vastly underutilized and some that are at, at or over capacity. Um, I think that one of the lessons we learned with Charter Oak was it seemed like we opened Charter Oak uh, in our last attempts around here. It seemed like maybe initially there was some discussion where we underutilizing that facility. But here we are three years in, and we're showing that it's going to be the next campus that's going to hit capacity because of the growth that we knew was coming to that area. So, uh, you know, uh, trying to establish attendance boundaries that can last the length of until you do, until you have future needs for future facilities. So we're going to look, uh, we're going to come back to you guys next month, uh, start that discussion around parameters. The goal, uh, kind of our timeline that we laid out is, is doing legwork between here, here and there, and then coming back to December and doing a full board workshop where we'll also discuss parameters and start getting into some of the factors that we're gonna need to look at, and then coming back, uh, you know, and getting another round of, of, of input and feedback from you guys in January as we, as we get closer. So uh, probably gonna have at least three opportunities for, for our facilities committee to weigh in. Uh, and, and at least two opportunities for the full board to weigh in before we get to the point where we bring recommendations to you. And with various opportunities for community input between now and then as well. But that we had a really good discussion the other night. We actually, uh, one of the things that's going on is tomorrow morning, we're gonna have kind of our first kickoff uh, meeting with, with our uh, members of our executive team and kind of really hone in on these dates that we've set. And I think we talked about that last month with you guys in with the full board about kind of the, the landmarks we want to hit on our different feedback levels and kind of what we want, what we, we really need to get accomplished by the end of October, what we really need to get accomplished by the end of November, December, or January, so that, that we really have, have a thoughtful process where we can bring really good options to you guys in February for approval. So that's, that's the goal, the whole step of the way is keep you guys, I think we have it listed is there's gonna be, you know, early in the process, there's opportunities for input, Later in the process, there's opportunities for feedback and refinement, but really trying to bring good recommendations forward that has a lot of community input, a lot of thoughtfulness into it, and really try to honor what these different groups that we gather input from value most in parameters. Mike, can you uh, give them an example of some of those parameters a little bit? Mm -hmm. Just walk them through a few things, and uh, board members, but some of the community members, what I'd ask you to do is think about those things that you're going to want to see in this process because we will be asking you for that feedback over the next couple of months. So. And the interesting thing about parameters too is, is that you, you won't be able to prioritize all of them because some of them conflict with each other. So you can't necessarily say neighborhood unity is the most important thing and we want every school filled at 89% capacity because if you get to that point, you're going to have to make some choices in some neighborhoods about where certain groups of kids need to go to get balanced enrollment across the district. But some of the things that, that would be considered in that, uh, obviously neighborhood unity, the idea of keeping neighborhoods together and keeping subdivisions together to the greatest extent possible, feeder pattern alignment, not having split feeder patterns to any, to any extent. We have a relatively small amount of feeder pattern uh, that, that aren't aligned right now, and it's typically but it's from elementary school to middle school, we have 100% middle school to high school feeder pattern alignment. But I will tell you this, even in a minimal amount, 
those are still families that you're having to have discussions with about you've gone to school at an elementary school for six years and 15% of those kids are assigned to a different middle school and those are difficult conversations to have and that's where some of our extenuating circumstance type discussions come in on, on transfers and things of that nature. So feeder pattern alignment, I'll, I'll speak from a student, student services standpoint, it's important, but it may not be the most important when you look at some of the other options. Uh, optimize the space and capacity, uh, that's going to be one that is going to be important. Uh, family impact, trying to impact the, the, the attendance boundaries for as few families as possible while still attaining your other goals. Uh, uh, handling growth, so it's not just meeting the needs of where we are right now, but where are we going to be five years from now when we want these attendance boundaries to still be effective. Um, socioeconomic factors, considerations in socioeconomic makeup of, of tenant zones, balancing for facility and program equity, um, traffic impact, that is one that our group the other night, they said we really need to look at the traffic impact of when we do boundaries, are they happening across major thoroughfares, are they having to go across 2305, are they having to go, you know, what, what, how does the traffic impact uh, relate to, what, what impact are we going to have on traffic patterns with the attendance boundaries we adopt? And I know in some campuses that's not a big deal, but in some campuses traffic's a really big deal right now for those communities. Uh, minimize the change, kind of goes along with family impact, but it could be, it could be extended outwards of that. Safety, are there safety considerations? Or do we have an impact on hazardous routes and things of that nature based on the attendance boundaries that we select? Uh, continu continuous boundaries is another. Uh, you know, do we not have something that looks like gerrymandering where one neighborhood is going to this school and all the neighborhoods that surround it are going to this school? And those are some of the things you have to get into if, if, if you make the priority to be balanced, enrollments and things like that. Transportation costs, you know, are we are we maximizing or minimizing transportation costs with the uh, with the boundaries that we choose and then natural lines too, you know, are we do we go with the tennis boundary lines that make sense? And I think that would be major thoroughfares, rivers, those sorts of things as well. So that's about 14. It's not all of them, but it's a lot of the ones that we considered. Uh, we'll also bring to you uh, it's for your view to see what the, the parameters that were prioritized with the last attendance boundary process we went through too. There were about five things that our, that our administration and our board at that time felt like these are the things we really want to accomplish with these attendance boundaries. And so that's kind of where, you know, you take this list of 14 or 15 and you, you get it down to what can we really do with this and still maximize the use of these, these new facilities that we're going to be able to bring on board and to be as kind as we can to families throughout the process as well. I would think that going and visiting with Liberty Hill, obviously there's another district from mm -hmm. the south that grows with about an elementary a year. Yep. Just kind of seeing how they handle these things because it, I mean, it doesn't take a lot of common sense to understand that when you build new buildings, you're going to have to move lines around. That's right. And there's just going to be some people that are just going to have some situations that aren't perfect. I don't know any other way around it. And you know, when we went through the last process, that was my first time around. Yeah. And it was, I really thought that with the community input, we went, had all those meetings down at Harris. I thought Templeton came through with flying colors last time. What do you think? And I thought they did such a good job. And I thought it was about as easy a process as, it, as something that's, that's tough to do could be. And I'm hoping that you know, we learned a few things. There's different leadership involved this time around. And we can lean on some of those things that we used last time because it seemed to work pretty well. Uh, but like I said, the climate has changed. Everybody's mad about everything. So we have to understand that that's going to be a part of this this time. Yeah. Where last time we were still, everything was still kind of, you know, there were a few people that were like, hey, I, I really like it. And y'all dealt with those kind of issues. People were upset. But I think we're in a different age. But I think the one of the key things that we'll have to decide, if, you know, you, uh, Chisholm Trail is our example. Chisholm Trail obviously grew a lot since the last attendance boundary that the tennis boundary change happened, but then we filled up to the trail and more, um, I think maybe even quicker than everybody had realized at that point. The thing that I think we just have to be careful of is to make sure that when we adopt these new attendance boundaries that we realize there's fluctuations that happen in these housing trends and in these enrollment trends. And so we can't make promises, we don't want to make promises that we can't keep on some of those things. One of the ways we could have balanced out Chisholm Trail in the last couple of years potentially is 
busing kids to different locations and stuff. And uh, those are the types of decisions we'll have to make moving forward. You know, Mike brought up utilization and fully utilizing all facilities in our district. And so busing is going to go off for longer distances and changing some of those attendance boundaries that are options that we have. But we also have to, when we go into this and we adopt those new attendance boundaries, just be careful about not making promises we can't keep and say, these are going to be good for seven years. Well, we, we know that's probably not going to happen that way, so we got to be careful. And you know, something that I've learned in this process of, of being on the board and being involved in the growth and the different things is there's some handshake deals that we don't know about right now yep. on some properties. Some, some deals in place that we just don't know about. It. Bob and them don't know about it. Yep. And that's kind of what happened to us in a couple of areas. There were some deals that were in the works that nobody knew about, and then it came to fruition, and, and you can't account for those things. There's just, there's no way to know when those developments are gonna come on. You just don't know. And if you take Tarver, for example, and the, all the stuff in the north, and all of a sudden the new master plan community comes up there and some acreage, and we have 2,000 new homes all of a sudden, that could change your attendance boundaries sooner than people realize. So I think going in, being really clear about what parameters we want to try and stick to, not make promises we can't keep in it, and do our best to learn from the success we had in that. I agree, I think whatever you did last time, we should learn from and build on. And something else that's in the background, we've, we've touched on it today, is when that fifth middle school comes online, that's when the feeder pattern and all that yeah. stuff's gonna change. You know, at some point, you're gonna have to tear the bandage off. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be an interesting one. <laughs> one other thing that we probably want to study, too, is go back to the 2014 when we opened, that was the last time we opened two elementaries at the same time and kind of see how how that process went as well because the one in the, one in the 2018 process for the 2019 school was, uh, you know, we were opening one elementary at that time. And this time we got two elementaries and an addition that's going to hopefully increase uh, capacity fairly well in Southwest too. So that's going to be uh, some other things to consider uh, as we go through this. It's going to be fun. Yeah. My, the, the thought that just keeps coming to my head, and since we're talking about this early on, is I, I can't place, and I think we probably could all agree on this, is we cannot be transparent enough through every step of the way. Um, I think that's really important, not just for us as a board and our, our staff, but to our families and our stakeholders that we just are as transparent every step of the way. Um, so we want to do it right. We know we're, you know, we're not perfect, but we're going to make the best decisions that we can, but just being transparent along the way. I don't, after watching the last couple of years, I don't doubt that that's going to I don't know how you can get on the All right. Any more questions on this one? All right. I guess uh, school naming update. Let me let me see. Who's going to talk to you about that? Uh, I'm going to stay here and talk to you about that. And this one's going to be fairly brief. I do want to give you an update. We have had a, a, an open, and I thought it was communicated well. I don't think we we tried to to um, keep it where only certain people can make nominations or anything like that. I mean, it's been it's been advertised uh, out there. We've, uh, I will say this, that we've kept uh, the nominations very, uh, the, the nomination period is still open, and we've really tried to keep that, uh, we haven't discussed that a lot, because we want it to be a impartial process, a fair process, and as we're finalizing uh, plans to get our committee together and follow our policy and follow kind of some of the, the uh, suggestions and parameters that y'all gave us when we talked about it before, we want to make sure that that process is not influenced. It shouldn't be influenced, and it's not going to be influenced based on who's been nominated. So we kind of that's a, that's been a really tight kept uh, process until the nominations close, until we are able to get it together. Uh, based on conversations we had with y'all previously, once nominations close, we will assemble our uh, long range planning, uh, or excuse me, <coughs> our facilities naming committee. Uh, we're going to try to uh, to honor and get that done in three meetings, as we discussed, and, and come back to you guys in November with with nominations for each campus that y'all will have ample time to consider, discuss, uh, weigh out, however you need to, as, as we get closer to a time for y'all to, to be able to, as a board of trustees, make the decision based on that. So I will say this, uh, the, the teasers I will give, 
Uh, we've had a little over 30 nominations so far. There's been a balance of nominations uh, and types of nominations. And I really do feel like our community has taken it seriously and they've thought about names or nominations that have been made that are uh, important to Belton, important to our community, uh, and, and kind of follow uh, those, uh, those nominations are, are things that, that all have been worthwhile considerations at this point. So um, I, I really have been impressed with the thought that has gone into nominations that have been brought forward by our community members. I don't even know that list. When he, when he says that we're, we're keeping that pretty tight, we're keeping that really tight. So, and I think that's a good thing. I think that you know, this is about trying to do what's right for the community on the side. Yeah, I followed a couple other uh, threads at WISD, and I've seen quite a few comments and quite a few. And I thought even those yeah. were, yeah. you know, let's celebrate. But there's there's yeah. a lot of things to celebrate here, and this is an opportunity. Whatever direction it ends up going, there's going to be a chance to celebrate yeah. our community and, and honor uh, and and move forward and, and exciting to you know we don't have to call them elementary 12 13 any longer so all right any questions all right so last name bond project updates so this is this one's really fun and rather than bring I didn't want to bring presentation into that I didn't know how long uh, our demographers update would go um, we're also going to get a, a pretty brief uh, full uh, full board update next week, but I just want to tell you just so I won't even go into last week or next week. Here's what's happened. And we had a holiday yesterday, and even though I know some of our some of our team was working with, with some of our design teams yesterday, but so just this week in a four day period, we're gonna have, we've had a we've already had a BHS, we've had a mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and roofing uh, meeting with the architect and uh, construction manager, BHS. Uh, Fine Arts stakeholder meeting was this afternoon from 1 to 3. Tomorrow we've got an attendance boundary kickoff meeting from 8 to 10. Uh, tomorrow we have a one hour Delta program stakeholder meeting, which is meeting really three uh, because of the, the meetings we've gone. Tomorrow we also have an ag facility stakeholder meeting with all of our high school ag teachers tomorrow afternoon. And then we also have upcoming, our, we had a Southwest Elementary stakeholders meeting on Friday morning. And this coming up week, we're going to have another Southwest Elementary, Lake Belt Middle School, and VHS, a bigger VHS meeting next week. So while I don't have a lot of slides to show you, and we're not to the point of schematic designs and conceptual drawings and things like that yet, there's no less than about six projects that are constantly meeting right now, moving forward and getting to you. Not only to mention the construction that's going on on number 12 and as we get closer to construction documents on 13. There's some challenges, uh, obviously, out there, and some things that we're working through with, with our design teams and things, but uh, couldn't be more excited and more proud of, of the Belt and ISD teams, whether that be with our, uh, our directors of construction projects and directors of facilities and construction and their teams, with our purchasing department, and you know just all of the different things that, are, that they're working through with, um, with our teaching and learning staff and, and, and our principal groups and those types of things. I mean, we got a lot of people bringing a lot of ideas to the table right now and, and kind of wading through those and coming up with the best the best recommendations for products, projects that we can get to with these groups is really important right now. So uh, very proud of that work. Can't wait to hear what our, our Delta folks come back tomorrow. Can't wait to hear what our ag teachers come come with tomorrow and just uh, really getting get to talk to some of those groups and go to the next levels of those discussions. So uh, we will have an update, like I said, at next Monday's board meeting. And I suspect by the November meeting and then by the January meeting, we're gonna have lots of lots of pictures to show you guys, lots of designs to show you guys and, and kind of show you the, the great ideas that are coming out of a lot of these meetings that are going on right now. One of the things that I think is always exciting about this too is that when you're going through a design phase, you, you get to uh, open up minds and realize that you're designing the buildings for the next 40 years, not the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty cool thing when you see that light bulb start to switch on with people and they're starting to realize this is a good opportunity for us to take a big step as a school district in whatever program area you're talking about, whether it be an ag barn or whether it be a Delta program facility. Um, it's pretty cool to see that. Sounds to me like I like all the, the information.
information in the meetings with our stakeholders. Because I think sometimes when you do build facilities, some people go back and go, well, I wish I would have had more input, yeah. such and such. So it sounds very accountable and it sounds very transparent, and I like that. So, any, any future concerns? Nothing? Let's see. It's 5.55 and we are done. Any policy committee? We went over an hour the other day, so we still got it. It's like triple nickels, man. This is good.